So this is my opportunity to update all of you on the many things that have been going on at the NIH and NINR since last we met in May. Um, as you are well aware, this is a very busy week. It's a, it's a historical it's a historical week in that um, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary for NINR at NIH. And, and with that, there are a number of events that are going on on campus and downtown. So we are pleased that you're all here and hope that you will participate in as many of these as possible. Um, so um, let me start with a budget update, what we know. Uh, about the budget at this point in time. Also bringing you up to date on some of the events in the uh, Department of Health and Human Services and NIH broadly, as well as what's happening at NINR. Now, as you are aware, at this point in time in the calendar, we don't always have a great deal of budget news, um, but I can tell you what we do know as of right now. So as of right now, we do not have a budget, but there is a great deal of activity going on down on the Hill on uh, both uh, the uh, House and Senate side. Congress has just reconvened, and they have a great deal of work to do be before, between now and when they adjourn. Um, the two major events that they're focusing on upon their return are um, funding for Zika and also getting a budget. As you know, we operate from year to year at NIH, and so in order to continue our operations, it's a requirement that we have a budget. What we might be looking at, um, uh, potentially, if there is no budget uh, at, per se, then we could be looking at a continuing resolution, which allows us to operate going forward at the same level that we're currently operating at. But it does allow us to operate without a budget, uh, as you well know from recent events. Without a budget, we um, are closed down essentially. Uh, so we uh, await the discussion of the budget. Um, the, there's been a great deal of positive dialogue on the Hill during the year about NIH, about medical research, and how important it is. And the president's budget, as you can see, <clears throat> was really about a flat budget uh, for us and, and just a slight increase uh, for um, NIH as a whole, uh, funds that were primarily earmarked for the Precision Medicine Initiative for Alzheimer's disease research and uh, uh, two other things as well. Uh, but the House and Senate budget for us also are, would it include an increase if either one of those go through. And we don't really know at this point in time, but that would um, involve um, an increase for us uh, if either of those bills or the compromise of those bills went through, which often happens is the Senate, the President proposes his budget. The House typically, historically, would propose their budget, which is often a little bit higher than what the President proposes. The Senate then is next, and they propose their budget, which then historically was usually a little bit higher than the House. And so given that there are three budgets or two actual bills that are circulating, the difference is usually uh, realized between the two bills. A, a conference is held, a conference bill is created, which is a compromise between the two bills of the House and the Senate. So, so if that were to happen, then we would be looking at an increase, which would be um, a, a really very positive thing for us. So stay tuned. Now, the budget that we do have is allocated accordingly. These are our actual obligations for, um, for fiscal year uh, 15. And, and you can see that the bulk of the budget that we do get, whatever funds we get, the bulk of that goes back out to the extramural community in the service of supporting research. Um, and so that roughly, although the specifics for the RPGs is 67%, when you add in the centers, the other research, which is primarily composed of Ks, and similar mechanisms, um, and um, the training, and most of the R&D, some of those are TAPs, sort of our, our rent for being part of the community, um, and some of the core resources that we do use with others on campus. So uh, about half of that. So you end up in the neighborhood of 80 to 85% of the budget does go out to extramural to support training and research. So you're very much a part of those decisions, and so that underscores the importance of the role that the council has. The, um, the remaining uh, intramural budget, 6% of our overall budget, is compares with the 10%. Most of the other institutes on campus have 10 to 11% of their budget dedicated to intramural. So our, pro our program is 
a bit smaller than that on average, but it is growing, and we do feel that it's very vibrant and uh, is making a number of important contributions to nursing science and also to nursing across the campus, the NIH campus. And you'll hear more about that today um, when you hear those presentations. And, um, and the other part, the RMS, is uh, research management services, which is essentially our overhead. And so if compare the 11% overhead that we have plus the TAPS, it still compares very favorably with the university settings, which are averaging around um, 40 to even 50% in some places. So, so we are very um, fiscally stingy, I guess you could say. Uh, moving to health and human services, to bring to your attention a, a one or two things that have happened there that are of particular interest. Um, the first, I would say, is that we now have a, a director appointed to, the, to head the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and that is Andrew Andy Bindeman, who is very much a health services researcher. He is a primary care physician and for the last 30 years has been doing research in um, healthcare, health um, healthcare services. Um, he's very um, well known in the community and, and very well regarded. So we um, are delighted that he is taking this post and look forward to interacting with him as strongly as we have in the past interacted with that agency. Um, we have a very um, strong interest and what they do, and look forward to those partnerships becoming even stronger. Um, now, at, at NIH locally, a number of things have happened since, I always say this, every <laughs> a lot happens here every day. Uh, certainly in three to four months, uh, an enormous lot happens. But, but just to bring to your attention a few of the things that are of particular interest and have particular impact on you potentially. Um, the first of these is the single IRB policy has been issued. Now, the NIH has adopted for multi-site trials a single IRB policy. And the intent of that, this is something that I know you're aware it's been in the works for some long time. And we have gotten um, feedback from the community um, as an NIH. And, and essentially, the, the idea behind this is that we've tried several experiments in some of the institutes across campus, and it has been successful. But the, the issue really is that um, to provide, that it can be successful in providing the best safety for patients. Um, in fact, we would argue that if a single IRB is used, then the requirements and the support for research for um, involving human subjects should be the same and should be equal everywhere. And so the idea is that it will, it will nor standardize what's required for safety of patients. And it will also, as a byproduct of the single IRB, will um, hopefully, presumably, slow down on, on many of the things that really take such a long time to get the approvals and to get the research started for all of you as investigators. And I know how frustrating that can be. So, so we're very optimistic about this. We were looking at it as an institute, but knowing that NIH was doing this systematically, felt that we would work with them and we would get this moving. And we're excited that it has actually gone through. Um, so you are very familiar with the Precision Medicine Initiative. Eric Dishman is coming shortly, who is the head of the project, uh, the newly, newly arrived head of the project, uh, to describe it to you in more detail. But just to update you on some of the, the part of the big picture parts of it is that the um, Precision Medicine has announced some $55 million in awards in July. These awards, and this is what was described to you previously, that the early stages of the Precision Medicine Initiative uh, is really designed to provide an infrastructure and provide vehicles for which research can be done using them or building on that. And so the awards that have gone out are, are large awards for um, community center engagement, for um, re data repository center, for um, biobank, and for um, Data Methodology Center for housing uh, and developing new 
data approaches. So, so those are the awards that have been made. Um, the Mayo Clinic has received the award for the Biobank, and that is, um, so you, they have a great deal of experience across the, probably uh, the most in the world. So, so um, we feel that we're in good hands with these centers growing and developing. But we're now at the stage where the research can be built upon and around these. So, so it'll be um, very good timing for Eric to be coming this afternoon and to talk to you about some of the future plans with that. Um, the um, next uh, one of the uh, other developments, you've been probably following the developments of the clinical center um, in the newspaper and throughout our, our uh, information uh, releases. But the, as a result of the red team study of the clinical center, which is a special committee from the advisory committee to the director, a number of recommendations were made for changes in the clinical center, which are thought to help it operate uh, more efficiently. And um, so those recommendations are now um, being uh, taken under consideration and being implemented on in as orderly a fashion as possible. Um, among those uh, was a re uh, recommendations was a reorganization, and so part of the reorganization is that there will be a it's a fairly complicated diagram which I suspect will change will be simplified a little bit as as the new folks are hired because um, when it gets implemented is you know when the rubber hits the road then you decide what to uh, what you can alter so um, part of that is a dual position that has been created which is the associate director for clinical research and the chief scientific officer, which the intent is that the patient safety and research both be considered um, important and, and to be uh, coordinated in ways that um, the research will be protected and the patient safety as well. So those are going to be combined in ways that it is felt by the red team that um, will serve our mission um, and preserve patient safety. So John, who has previously been the director of the clinical center, has um, agreed to take this position on. Um, and he will stay in the director position as they are recruiting um, a CEO and a COO and a chief budget officer. So, so those recruitments are ongoing now, and we await uh, what um, will be coming from that. Um, now, the, another new appointment is that of Joshua Gordon, who has been named the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, Josh has been um, selected to oversee the part of the agency which supports research in mental health. He will join NIH um, later this month. Uh, by the end of September, he's coming on board. He's coming to us from New York City. He's at Columbia University. He's a professor of psychiatry there uh, and is a research psychiatrist um, in, at Columbia. His area of research is in the area of genetics of schizophrenia and also anxiety disorders. So, so we um, are looking forward to him joining the team. He's a very enthusiastic and energetic person and really looking forward to coming to NIH where he can uh, oversee this uh, enormous um, portfolio of research uh, on, in the area of mental health and also carry on his own research program. Another appointment is that of Dr. Diana Bianchi. She has been named the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Diana um, will be coming, um, she's actually expected to join us at the end of October um, uh, and uh, is coming to us from Tufts uh, University Medical Center. She is a pediatrician whose specific expertise is in the area of perinatal um, genomics and also um, related to screening, uh, perinatal screening. And so, so she also is um, very enthusiastic about coming on board and we await her arrival um, as uh, she's coming just at the beginning of the new fiscal year. Uh, the, uh, another, uh, another item I wanted to bring to your attention is that the, um, before, we've mentioned before that NIH has regional seminars on grantsmanship and these seminars travel across the country and they try to um, make them geographically disparate and they are, they sent, the teams that are sent out are very interdisciplinary from an NIH point of view in that the, and the grant, related to the grants process. So you have program directors, you have budget officers, you have um, grants management. Um, and so these teams um, do um, cross the country 
And the next one is coming in Oct end of October 26th to 28th and will be um, at Chicago, Illinois. Um, and um, so it, those of you who happen to be in the area or, or live nearby or students, um, it, this is always something that's very informative and it's a good opportunity to see the whole team interacting. As always, a reminder that we have initiatives that we bring to your attention within NINR, from NINR, but that NIH itself has initiatives that are of interest to um, our community as well. And these typically are initiatives that we join in as they are of interest to us and can contribute and participate in them. And that means also that we add language to that is particularly um, deferential to the needs of our scientific uh, population. So, so these are the ones, and I won't read them to you because you can read them yourselves, but just so that you know where the, um, the website is that you can discover these for yourselves and find out more about them if you are in, uh, interested in any of them or think you might be. So let us move on um, to uh, NINR itself. Um, as you uh, are very well aware, since you're so much a part of it, this is the 30th anniversary. We have a number of events this week and, and some that are upcoming. Um, many of you, probably all of you in the room, are signed up for a scientific symposium tomorrow, which will be in the afternoon. We actually, the council members, you have a very eventful day that we have planned for you. So we'll have the council in the morning. And then we will uh, shuttle you uh, across the campus to the clinical center so that you can participate in the NIH uh, research festival, which we are co-chairing. I have a slide to talk about that, but basically we are co-chairing that as well. That's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then we will shuttle you downtown so that you can attend the um, noted on this slide 2016 Scientific Symposium in the afternoon. Um, and then later this year, um, November 1st, we have the next uh, NIR director's lecture, and that will be Sandra Millen Underwood from University of Wisconsin discussing her research uh, in health disparities. So we look forward to that as well. And this is a very good segue to say, as we celebrate the 30th anniversary, that we do, uh, we have been working very hard with your input on the um, strategic plan covering the next five years. That strategic plan will be available and will be handed out tomorrow afternoon. <clears throat> and it is very much, you all have been part of it in that this uh, planning for this, obviously the planning for the next strategic plan starts almost as soon as you publish the one that you've just finished. But we have been working on this for, um, for several years, starting with the various, each time we go out to meetings, we attend the meetings and we listen to the science and we talk to participants, but we're really looking for what's the new science, what are the new ideas. Each time an investigator puts pencil to paper and writes a grant application, that helps us to plan the science. Um, so because it says, here's what we think is important, we the scientific community. So, so there are a number of inputs, but one of the primary inputs for this uh, strategic plan that was different it was that of the Innovative Questions Initiative. And so we did have teams of experts coming in to answer the question, what do you think in your area of scientific expertise? What are the questions that we haven't been asking that we should ask? Where, where do we go next? What do you think are the most important questions to ask? And so from those questions and from all of that input from the teams that came in and from the website and all the input we got, we were able to use all of that information in moving forward and planning a document that was really very reflective of what the scientific community feels in addition to what our thinking is about how you move forward in the science. So that we're very excited about the plan, and we think you will be too because it, you're so much a part of it. Um, and that will be available um, tomorrow afternoon. So look forward. It'll be hot off the press too. Uh, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> there's nothing like trying to print something on a schedule, which uh, always um, is a challenge. Uh, so moving on to other news, we have been very active across the country in um, celebrating the science of the last 30 years and the next, um, uh, the, going into the next 30. Um, and so part of that celebration, uh, we have attended a number of, of meetings across the country um, and talked about that science. And this slide shows uh, Academy Health Meeting, which highlighted the 30 years of, of nursing science which um, was a panel, a panelist, uh, two people, two of our scientists joined uh, me in the panel. Um, uh, we had 
outstanding uh, presentations from Dr. Linda Aiken about her work um, in the workforce issues and some of the um, health services research that she has done, which is so patient-oriented and very outcomes-oriented. And Dr. Pam Hines, who talked about her efforts in developing a model and testing a model of bereavement for um, parents of seriously ill children. So it was very well attended and was really uh, quite an exciting session. Uh, something else at that particular meeting that we were gratified, um, Dr. Mary Naylor, who um, is, has um, done such important work in this area, uh, was honored with the Distinguished Investigator Award from Academy Health. And that, they, there are a number of awards at Academy Health and they were, they were all posted, but this is what they consider their most important and their most prestigious award. And so it was very exciting and, and uh, we were very pleased for her. Uh, it's just a remarkable accomplishment. So other, other things that are happening that are exciting, we, we've talked before about the NIH symptom science model, and that's something that was designed in our intramural program and has been, as, and is being tested out in that program. Uh, you have seen the publication that describes it and outlines it and provides the rationale for it. And so this, um, this time I'm showing you one of the follow-up publications. We anticipate a number of them, but this is an example of the um, testing the model and how it's being used to shed light on patient symptoms. And so this is coming from intramural program and further explicates some of the studies that are going on using this model. And um, so I would refer you to it. It's, it's really a, a, an excellent way to demonstrate how the model works. We also have been moving forward on our plans for the Symptom Science Center. The, we gathered a group of experts um, to help us on next steps in the Symptom Science Center within the intramural program. We've had the um, very um, outstanding help of Dar Mar Dr. Margaret Gray over the last year to help us look at some of the aspects of this that would be particularly promising and how we could best use the environment here at NIH and how we could design this so that it would be a resource for our extramural community and to be, help us to develop things that can both uh, work extramural uh, more closely with us, but also to devise things that we can then export to extramural. So we're moving forward on that and we'll keep you posted on, on its development. So we have a special report in the Journal of Palliative Medicine which summarizes a recent meeting that we held Actually, um, it's been several months now. Uh, I've mentioned it to you in a previous council, but on um, palliative care for serious advanced rare diseases. And this was um, a workshop that convened a large group of interdisciplinary group of people with expertise in this area or expertise to bring to bear in this area, particularly focusing on advanced rare diseases. And so this was a workshop that was um, co-sponsored by our Office of Rare Diseases. And um, so the summary of that meeting and the recommendations that were made by those experts are available in this publication. Further in this area, the National Academy of Sciences, you heard, those of you who heard Ellen Goodman this morning, heard her mention the IOM report, uh, the recent report on, uh, on dying in America and how influential that is. Uh, and that is one of the things that is uh, an outcome of that report is that the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine, is, is, um, has formulated a roundtable on quality care for people with serious illness. And that is being um, co-chaired by um, James Tulsky, who is one of the co-authors of the Dying in America uh, uh, report and also is a former council member. So we also have a seat on that round table and that is being shared, but mostly being filled by Jerry Miller from, from our staff. The, another, uh, Another event in this area was a workshop on advancing and extending palliative care research agenda in the specialties. And this, is, um, this was a meeting which was held uh, in conjunction with the National Institute on Aging and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to look at areas of promise and, and areas of gaps in this area. So those recommendations um, will be becoming available. 
We also have, uh, you, you recall, um, you've heard a bit about the, co uh, the palliative care conversations matter um, initiative that we have, the um, program for public awareness um, and community outreach. And that, the latest, uh, the latest uh, launch of that was directed toward patients and their families um, of those who have uh, children with serious uh, illness and their families. And so we've now added to the website an animated uh, video that is sort of, it's a new, it's a new technique that's used and I, I know that Adrian and Doug Hussey would love to explain it to you in great detail, but basically it's kind of somewhere between it's a kind of a combination between human figures and the anime of um, of uh, the graphics uh, community. And but what it is is it explains what the materials, the written materials, tell you. Explains in a very short video. And and so it's kind of interesting. I I would suggest just going on the website and looking at it because it's quite an interesting way of communicating. And it's quite it's quite effective in a very short period of time. We also have now launched the mid-career grantsmanship videos. The um, slide you see is Joan Austin, who is in the audience, um, and um, Randy Jackson, who she's interviewing on how he is, uh, has formulated his career, some of the things he's thought about, how is it, and how he's um, monitoring and checking, how's it going. Um, this is an outcome of the presentations the workshops that we held at the regional meetings across the country, and those were those were well received. But each, you know, at each regional meeting, perhaps fifteen to twenty people would be there, and so at most we could we could reach eighty people, perhaps. So, by distilling the information from the um, course that was presented and putting it on our website in small modules, we feel that it, we know that it will be available to many more people. And, and so far, it's been extremely, the response has been uh, very positive. And so um, we appreciate Joan and all the work that she's done and, uh, and Carol and Samsell also helping out on that. So, and we also appreciate a number of staff members were involved in this and making it happen. Um, so um, I would say uh, tune in and take a look and advise your faculty and students to take a look too because even though it was geared to mid-career, there are a number of hints and tips in there that are quite useful to learn as early as possible. So I would suggest um, it, advertising it widely. So um, we do have a number of uh, initiatives that are currently active, um, funding announcements and opportunities that are available. And um, so I, this slide uh, tabulates the ones that are currently uh, available and still active until um, 2018 or 2019. Recall that uh, program announcements are viable for three years. RFAs are one time only. And so we tend to go more toward program announcements than RFAs uh, with some rare exceptions. We also, um, this is also a reasonably rapidly changing slide. So, uh, so do be sure to check that website to see which um, new things are coming out. You also, I know your uh, grants offices uh, subscribe to the uh, grantsmanship uh, journals, but still this is a very good way for you personally to find it out quickly. The Summer Genetics Institute was held in June of this year on campus, um, was uh, very successful, very positive outcomes. We now have more than 350 graduates of this course who are seated around the entire country. And um, we're very um, pleased that one of our first graduates of the first one, Dr. Ann Cashin, has, in, has put that uh, information to use so well in her career um, and is joined by, by many others across the country. Um, so that this really is, recall, intended for people to take this information and to be able to enter the conversation, to use the information in their programs of research, in their teaching, and in their clinical practice. And so those goals um, continue to be realized and uh, we're very um, excited about that. It's actually, it's interdisciplinary and we, and it's very well received. The method, the boot camps are newer and so our symptom, our methodologies boot camps continue to be very popular. This, recall that we, um, these boot camps were designed to introduce the participants to the latest methodologies for symptom science research and 
we started the first, um, the first two were on pain, and then we did um, sleep and fatigue, and then we moved into um, uh, precision medicine, but we now, um, or, or data science actually, but, but now we have a combination, so it's from omics to data science. This particular boot camp, and they do fill up quite, quite rapidly, we're trying to figure out how we can do a lottery or some, some other way of getting people signed up so that we can get a little bit more um, of a span of who we could get into these courses, but we had 160 participants last time from over 75 different institutions across the country. So we are able to get a broad um, catchment of people coming in and to participate in this course. Um, the the uh, feedback is very positive. It's a week-long course and it's very intense. The first day of it is video cast and so that's available for you on the website. The other days are more uh, focus group oriented, a little bit more individual, but the first days um, where we have the talks um, from a number of the um, stars in the, in the particular areas, uh, those are available on the website for you right now. The Graduate Partnership Program, which is very, uh, also very popular. Uh, we're very proud of the graduates, and I know you are too, because we share them. They're really your graduates, but we feel happy to have a part in that. Um, that um, so the uh, an application period is now open for the 2017 class. In my travels, I often am asked about this by the students I'm asked frequently. And it is just, uh, what I will say is that the graduates of this uh, GPP program really do tend, they're the people that you see out in the community rising rather quickly because they do, um, we were sort of saying, well, from within five years, your, your face also could be on the program of a regional meeting. <laughs> because it's really, um, it, it really, I, I think one of the things, it's you get exposed to a lot of different scientific ideas in um, the two year period of time that you spend here. You also get to see a lot of interdisciplinary activity, participate in it. And one of the things that I, if I were to characterize besides the fact that, that the graduates of this program just uh, do super well, I, I think a piece of it is the ability to network that the ability to identify who science might be helpful to you, who you might want to participate with or partner with, and to be able to go and locate that and talk to that person and get involved in their research and vice versa. I've noticed that that's a particular strong point of people who participate in the program and then leave and go out to a variety of academic settings. So we encourage you to uh, take a look at your student body and who might benefit from this experience and, and to encourage them to contact us. So among the other opportunities, we do have a number of training opportunities in the summer for summer students. And so this past year, we had over 20 trainees of postdocs, fellows, um, postbacs, uh, a few high school students. Um, and so we had about 20 of these. And this shows you the, the breadth of the, the uh, geographically where they came from, which actually is a much broader span than you might expect. Um, they typically spend eight weeks here at the NIH campus. They also, and of, of this group, and sometimes you know they're always in a hurry to go somewhere at the end of the summer, but but we had 11 out of the 20 participated in the NIH Student Research Day and received very positive comments for the work they did. But that's also a measure of how much they get done in eight weeks, that they're able to have a poster and be able to participate uh, with work that they have had a major role in themselves. And so I think that speaks well um, for the program and for the experience that they get. Okay. Um, so an area that we've talked about from time to time, and I know Council has brought it up, and we're always grateful for your comments because they're very helpful. And so one of the things that I wanted to give you an update on is something that I've talked about before, and that is um, the review of grant applications. And this is a, a CSR update. You know, we've heard from Richard Nakamura before he's come to speak to us, who's the director of CSR. Um, and, and remember now, CSR is another piece of the 27 institutes and centers. They're one of the centers. They do not have a separate appropriation. Um, they do not work for us. So even though people say there's a nursing study section, they really don't work for us. Most of you know that, but, but it, every once in a while, um, 
people sort of think that I can tell them what to do, and you know, it's just, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but, um, but it's designed that way for a reason, because we want to keep the evaluation of the science separate from issues such as um, it's in response to program announcement or it's important to the mission of the institute. So, so we really want, that's your job to help with that part of the decision. But the first initial review is really about the science and the technical merit and the promise of the application separate from any other considerations. And so over the years, you know, there have been some changes in CSR and changes in the study sections, which you all know. But over time, what, it's been an evolution, but what has happened is our applications, recall we had two study sections for a while that really primarily reviewed our applications. Well, then it turned out that we were getting fewer applications in, and so then it, they were kind of all going to one study section with the overflow going somewhere else. And so coupled that with the fact that we had a limitation of the number of, of chartered groups we could have. So what became the norm was more that the overflow of applications would go to so-called SEPs, special evaluation panels. Um, and that, that is a reasonable idea. But over time, those panels do not, they're not constituted um, in a standard fashion so that they, they do not consistently contain the same reviewers. So that an application might come in and for re-review and would end up going to a, quite a different group. And so we looked at the data and realized that really about 40 some, close to 50% of our applications were going to study, other study sections and, and a, a larger number so that you don't have critical mass in any one study section. So Richard and I met and our respective staffs and we talked about this. And he was not only receptive, but had really identified on his own that this was an issue. And so we've been working over the summer on what to do about this. And he, so currently now, what the plan is, um, and Richard will take this plan to his council, and then he'll come to speak to us in September. Um, but the, uh, I'm sorry, May, he'll come in May. But the plan now is that we still have the, the primary nursing study section, but that the others could be, that the SEPs really could be coalesced into probably two study sections. And possibly a third, depending on how many so-called orphan applications that, orphan applications are ones that come in to go to other study sections that sometimes the investigator will say, I want this to go to X study section. Well, sometimes it may or may not seem the best once it gets here. But if the investigator asks for it to go to a study section, they try to give you what you want. And so, but, so, so these are called orphans because they are supposed to go somewhere that we're really not sure would be the best home for them. And so, so those orphans could also go into these proposed study sections. So what that means is that we would be looking at applications going to probably three study sections total, one that it's been going to, and then two others that will be stable study sections. Now that plan will hold as long as we keep getting applications. If we constitute that again and then we get fewer applications, then we could be back historically where we were before where there won't be enough to fill those uh, study sections. But, but the importance of this is that they will have stable uh, reviewers, stable population of reviewers, and that there will be a critical mass, so that the most, so there'll be a critical mass of applications that deal with nursing science in those study sections. And we feel that that will um, really enhance the quality um, and satisfaction of the review. So thank you all for your input into this, because you know we do get um, comments about this, you know, throughout the year, and 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 as always. Um, you know, Richard is very receptive, uh, particularly um, in his leadership style, but, but we do need specific examples. And so you've been really helpful in coming forward with specific examples that we could look at systematically. And uh, so anyway, so we, we believe that this plan will be um, a very good one and will have some positive results. So, so to be continued on that one. 
Now, moving a little bit closer to home, we have a number of things that have been happening in our staff as well, or to our staff, or our accomplishments of our staff. Um, so the first of these is that Patty Brennan, who has just literally been sworn in yesterday as the director of the National Library of Medicine, is joining us in our intramural program as an adjunct investigator. She will ha bring her lab with her, and her work is focusing on the use of uh, cutting edge data visualization um, processes and virtual reality to focus on people who are homebound to be able to help them to be more active and relate more, um, become more independent um, homebound individuals. And so, so we're very enthusiastic about that. Her program of research really does, we think, um, complement very nicely what we're doing and also um, fills some needs of what we don't have that she has and vice versa. So we're really very enthusiastic about that. She's, as you know, a very talented and very enthusiastic person. So the first thing she said is, thank you so much for my lab. I wanted a big room and you got it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice when somebody new gets so excited <laughs> because you know our space around here is um, a bit limited and we have uh, we struggle with the uh, leaky pipes in the old buildings but um, but anyway um, so we're, we're very enthusiastic about that partnership um, uh, also I mentioned before that uh, our own Dr. Ann Cashin, um, Scientific Director for NINR, is co-chairing the NIH Research Festival this year, which coincidentally is celebrating 30 years as well. So we um, uh, were kind of, as you are at home, doing double duty on a few things this, um, this week. But um, so if you don't see Ann, you'll know she's over. It's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we will be able to incorporate, tomorrow, incorporate you tomorrow. I felt it was really a shame for you to be here and not participate in the research festival at all. So we will make that possible for you to um, attend a part of that tomorrow. And as it turns out, the, the session that is a, it fits in your time frame is the bench to bedside segment of the program. And so one of our investigators newly um, selected on the tenure track, uh, Katie Mayer will be doing one of the presentations. You'll hear her um, today as well. But, but it just worked out that way. So I wish I, I should tell you that we planned it that way. But actually, what we did plan is for her to talk a little earlier to make sure that you got to hear her before we took off to go downtown. But anyway, so it's a very, um, very exciting uh, for the visibility for Ann and for the program. Um, and so, um, and it'll be a really exciting uh, festival. It always is. So, uh, two of our uh, participants uh, at the festival, who also um, are hard at work in our intramural program, um, have received one of the things that characterizes our intramural program somewhat differently than the others is that our investigators compete for and successfully um, receive extramural funding, not from NIH, of course, but from, uh, from foundations and such. So that, that, that's something which uh, really is a level of independence that, that some of the other programs don't encourage. But so two examples of that are Polly Joseph who, um, and uh, Kristen Weaver, who've both received Heilbrunn Nurse Scholar Awards from NYU this past year. These are one to two year awards. Um, Polly's award, Polly's a postdoc, and her award is to look at the um, brain uh, gut access in, related to uh, nutritional uh, issues, uh, obesity, insulin resistance, et cetera. Um, and Kristen is looking at the brain gut axis um, and, and hormones, in fact, which uh, influence the brain gut axis in patients with IBS. So, so these are very uh, important clinical problems, and um, we're very pleased for them. This is quite an honor. And segue into that, you could tell who their mentor was from the science that I was describing. <laughs> Wendy Henderson, uh, we congratulate her on her uh, induction into the American Academy of Nursing. That is um, uh, a tribute to the work that she has done um, in her career, and we're pleased that much of it has been here. <clears throat> Um, not, not to leave anyone out here, um, Jessica Gill has um, just received the Johns Hopkins Distinguished Alumnus Award for her career to date. Um, and um, that is also uh, quite an honor as well. Um, so we're very pleased for Jessica. 
And as you recall, Jessica's work is in the area of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, and uh, last but not least, our new tenure track investigator, Katie Muir, um, has just recently, in fact, the bio sketch in your, in your notebook probably says she's an assistant clinical investigator, but she is, uh, as of a month ago, roughly, um, has been appointed to the tenure track. Um, Katie's work is in the area of of uh, patients with neuromuscular disorders, particularly uh, serious life-limiting uh, disorders uh, and in children. And the reason, one of the reasons this is so important is that the, there are very few um, therapeutic interventions, almost uh, nothing has been discovered that is helpful, and so the outcomes in this population um, are you know, are very negative outcomes. And uh, so uh, Katie is committed to try to change that. Dr. Pamela Tamez, who is here in the audience. Uh, Pamela is over on the other side. Okay, Pamela's over there, okay. Uh, has joined us, uh, has been named as the uh, Intramural Deputy Training Director. She has actually been working for us, uh, with us for a while in a capacity similar to that, but she has been working as a contractor and finally decided that she, I guess the period of studying us was over, that she would join the team. So we're very happy to have her on board and to have us um, help out with all of the training uh, that we have described. So with that, uh, my remarks uh, are my formal remarks for the day um, concluded. And we do have, a, there are a number of more things that are happening that I haven't mentioned. I've actually sort of selected. But we do have handouts available at the door for you as you leave, um, which will tell you in great detail some of the other things that are happening. Um, and meanwhile, I just say that this is a terrific week. I'm happy that everyone is here because it's very exciting, uh, starting today all the way through the rest of the week, um, through Saturday. Uh, we will be um, exposed to an enormous number of wonderful scientific findings and have to be, to be very privileged to have a look um, at what the future is going to look like. And that's pretty exciting when you look at the scientific things that we're looking at now and how that's going to help us shape our future and improve the quality of our lives. So with that, thank you very much. Um, as you know, I'll be away. I'll be available all week <laughs> for other questions. So.